Glass has always helped with these in balance as well. It does actually, it doesn't slip then. We need to put Velcro on your head. Yeah, it's coming back. Just, okay, just keep bleeding out. <laughs> it is. It is, is it? I don't think it's as much polish, no, need to polish it. Well, it looks a bit less shiny than usual. Yeah, I used to use a lot more polish at one time. <laughs> Bills have gone down the telly. Evening, everyone. Evening, Sally. You can see what sort of day we're having already, can't you? See what happened this morning? This is what happens this evening. <laughs> it doesn't stop. It won't stop. Pretty. Today's talk, so I can't say I'm preaching or anything, it's talk right now. It's about being alive. First, of course, what do I usually do is ask questions. But before I ask you these questions, I want you to please be honest with yourself. Because the questions you're going to be asked, I don't want to sh hear anybody shout out Jesus or God unless it is absolutely 100% truth. But be honest with yourself. If the answer is family, if it's friends, if it's work, if it's extreme sports, anything, be honest. All right? First question. What makes you feel alive? Hmm? It's God. Okay. 100%. For me, when I think about so, God. Why does it make you feel alive? Get three questions, I'm gone. Oh, don't go on. What makes it, God make you feel alive? It gives me purpose in life. He's everything and he's, he's on my mind 24 7. Fair comment. Anybody else want to own up anything? If not, it's all right. No? Okay. Okay, I would say we'll get to know each other a little bit better, what keeps us alive, but okay, we just know Wayne right now. <laughs> but that's fine. So, next question. What does it mean to be alive in Christ? What does it mean to us? Anybody? Get closer to God. Get closer to God. Doris? To me, to be alive in Christ means He's your everything. He's, he's, he consumes every minute of your day. Not because he forces himself onto you, but it's because as your relationship develops, he just becomes that way. He's just everything you do, say, think, comes to him. Focused on him. Cool. Again, we know Wayne a bit more better because of how he reacts and how passionate it is about Jesus and Christ. What's it been alive for Wayne? That was a perfect example. So let's go on to John 1, 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Right, we, can anybody remember Wayne's sermon about the Trinity? Mm -hmm. No, not Trinity for Matrix. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, even though she looks good in the leather bit. So what do we do about the Trinity? It's, name the Trinity. Father, Hard to hear you, Louise. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you. Hope this might explain, because I know Sometimes we can't understand how God can be the Father, how God can be Jesus, or how they can be the Holy Spirit. Well, look at this. The Father glorifies the Holy Spirit. 
I can even print this out for you to, if anybody ever wants this to understand what the Trinity is. So I think this is the best picture I've actually found that ex tries to explain it all. What do you reckon, Wayne? Have a look. The way I see the Trinity is Jesus said, I am the Father and Father in me. So they're each part of each other, but it's yeah. distinct individual beings, and each one of them shares the same essence that makes them God. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's like the Son is not the Father, but the Son is in the Father, and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. Mm. Until I found that the other day, and I think that hopefully simplifies what the Trinity is. To help people to understand, because it's such a hard subject for someone who doesn't understand it. Mm -hmm. okay, for me, uh, God revealed it to uh, the understanding I have over a period of years. And I was thinking, well, it came to me bit by bit by bit. Yeah, but well, you know, some people they like to have the answer there and then, don't they? Oh, I know. <laughs> so we, we know a little bit more now about the Trinity. All three connected. All as one, but they're different at the same time. We know that they're individual, but here I believe, looking at the scripture that I've just read, it's talking about both ways God as one, God as the Son. Because believe it or not, Jesus was here at the time of creation. This is what I believe John 1. 1 to 4 is on about. He's talking about Jesus in the Father, who is God, mm -hmm. creating creation. So the word, what I believe, means Jesus. He is the word. He is the light. The original Greek translation of the word is logo, which means between, mediator, or intercessor. That's what the word means. And what is Jesus? He is the intercessor for us to God. So he is the word. And that's John 1, 1 to 4. So from the start of the creation, we can clearly see here that Jesus was with God. He, re re uh, he created the heavens, he created the earth, animals on the earth, sky, sea. We all know the story of creation. He was even there when God created Adam and Eve. Guess what? Jesus is also with you now, today. Right this second. Because he has never disappeared. He has never gone. He is still alive in us today. Do you all know the story of the thief and the robber and the shepherd? Yes, I know it sounds like a joke. Have you heard this joke? This is, this is the thief, the robber. The shepherd, they all walked into the bar. That's how I feel like taking the time of the story. But, but let's go look at John 10, 1 to 5. Is this echoing a bit? Yeah. Yeah? It's getting on my nerves as well. Yeah. I, can, I can hear myself breathing and I don't like it. Banging around too much. Right, let's get rid of that. I'm alright. You can hear me still, yeah? Sue, can you hear me? That's very important that you hear me. Would you write at the back? That's why. <laughs> so let's have a look at John 10, 1 to 5. Okay, not that one. Hang on, <laughs> missed one. Wait a minute. Where'd you go? Oh, there we are. Missed it. Missed one that one. Let's have a look at John 3 first. I missed one. See, I told you you couldn't hear me. I could hear you, but not without straining. So. Oh, there we are. I don't want to wear me. <laughs> Should have put this one on first, sorry. Right, so for this one. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, 
or in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. See, again, he's already here from the beginning. He's alive right now. Right, now I'll go to um, John 10, 1, 5. <laughs> Skipping ahead a bit. I'll tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they, they recognize his voice. But they will not follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not, I mean, do not recognize this stranger's voice. Does anybody get a sense of what this one's talking about? It's how you personally know and personally relationship. This shepherd is having, who knows his sheep personally, knows every single one. If one was injured, he'll know it personally. He knows them, he cares for them, every individual one. He doesn't want to push one aside. He knows them as a group, he knows them individually. He takes care and pride into looking after his sheep. In fact, I would say he will probably love his sheep because he's protecting them with his life. Right, let's have a look at the next one. John, there's a lot of scripture from John 10 because I found that really helpful for today's talk today. So let's go for John 10, 10 to 11. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. As we can see in verse 10, we all know what verse 10 means. Jesus here is talking about Satan himself. Mm -hmm. How much does Satan destroy? How much does he kill? Physically, mentally, kill. How much does he destroy? He goes, goes in, destroys relationships. He destroys destroy families. He destroys other relationships. Any relationship there is, Satan will destroy it. So you would turn away from God. But Jesus is the good shepherd. He wants you to have a life. He wants you to have relationships. He wants you to love others. He does not want you to turn away from others. He is all about love. He is the good shepherd. John 10, 14 to 16. Again. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and the sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know my Father. And I lay down my life for my sheep. If you look at all this already in John 10, John is, Jesus is already telling everybody who he is, why he came, and what's going to happen to him? He's already warning everybody. He's laying down his life for his sheep, for his followers who know him personally. He's already given, through everything that I've read, that I've tried to study, he's already given the warning signs for those that are around him. They just didn't understand. It's just an advantage that we can understand this now. Let's exactly have a look what a good shepherd is. 
or what it actually means. And like, you might look at a good shepherd in a different way. It'll, more, it'll I'll show you. The Greek word translated to good is helps, which actually translated to genuine or approved. That's what the word good means. It means genuine. Jesus is genuine. There is no falseness about him. There is no fakeness about him. There is no blemish on him. And he's actually free of sin. He is genuine. He is not like Satan, who is the father of lies, who steals, destroys, and kills, who's deceitful. Jesus is genuine. having that relationship, what, do you, what the good shepherd has, okay, or the genuine shepherd. To understand, I become, um, yeah, acquainted? Like, yeah, acquainted with someone means to have a personal relationship with that person. It's not simply knowing someone through a text or a textbook. It's that, it is not knowing like knowing someone through a history or someone famous. To know someone is in this context is an intimate knowledge. The good shepherd, the genuine shepherd, had intimate knowledge of his sheep. And they had intimate knowledge, even though they were sheep, that who their genuine shepherd was. And he knew what makes you tick. Jesus knows what makes you tick. You can try and hide, but you still can't hide from Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit. You cannot hide. He knows the truth about you. So get rid of the father of lies. Be honest to yourself and to be honest to God. Because that's what he wants. That's where it went wrong in the Garden of Eden. The deceitfulness of Satan, which killed and destroyed the relationship between Adam and Eve and God. not in my sheep pen, in this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. So what does it mean about this verse? Well, God had a chosen, his chosen people, the Jews. There was it, they are his original flock in the pen. That's the original flock. But God and Jesus inv <coughs> invited the Gentiles, the others outside the pen, because he knew that they were also listening to God's voice. Look at the centurion, the time that Jesus died on the cross, saying he really is the Son of God is really the Christ. Mm -hmm. The centurion who came and got help for his servant, they definitely were not Jews. They were Romans or Roman traders. They are the people who still knew Jesus' voice and had faith in God even though they were not part of his people. So God is calling everyone, it's everyone's heart and ears to be open because God is calling out for everyone. Everyone was created by God 
and they are all his sheep. They are all his followers, but they do not know it yet. And it's all to do with that personal relationship. The reason why, John 10, 17 to 18, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own record. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. The command I received from my father. So here, Jesus is actually saying his father commanded him to die on his cross for us to take away the sin because we are failures. He died for every single one and he rose again to keep us alive, alive in Christ and Christ in us. He came back so we can be alive and not die of sin. We do not die the spiritual death. We do not die the second death because we rose again with Christ on the third day. Our sins died, our old self died on that cross with Jesus and we was risen with him alive on the third day. We are alive in Christ today. He is alive in us today. I need to calm down. <laughs> okay. Romans 6, 8 to 11. <clears throat> now, if we died with Christ, we will believe that we also live with him. This is Bible. This is God talking. Okay? For we know that since Christ was risen from the dead, he cannot die again. <coughs> Death no longer has master over him. Jesus was dead one time. Only once. We can't keep putting him back on that cross. <coughs> We've got to understand Jesus died once. We can't keep putting him back on like everybody does. We walk around and look at these necklaces. Jesus is still hanging on the cross. He is down. He is alive. He is seated on the throne next to God so we can be alive today. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> the resurrection set Jesus free from the authority of death. In the same way, we, we died to our sin, but through faith in Christ, we are no longer forced to admit to sin. Further, this separation from the power of sin is permanent. Death can no longer reign over our lives, over any person who believes in Christ. Christ. We will not die of sin because of Christ. Because he already sacrificed himself for us. Verses 10. The death he died. Oh, I'm all brain, that one then. All right, I'm going that one. I'll get there in a minute. And this one. It's fine. Can we go back? Two seconds. No, backwards. 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 Oh, that'll do. It's playing up. Excuse me a minute. Oh, no. there's no, there's no. Ten. no. The death he died, there we are. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. Just once, remember, once. But the life he lives, he lives in his life, lives in God. In the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but be alive to God in Jesus Christ. 
when Jesus died on the cross, he died for our sins, like I said. So that when we are forgiven of many sins that we have committed throughout our lives, he died unto his sin so that we may be that we will be released from the conditions that we have caused us to sin. He died to set us free from any influence and power of sin. He died to sin so that we, we can be free from our old selves and our old sin and our old sinful nature. He died to sin once and for all. No dying again, no putting him back on the cross like I said. Our new position in Christ has removed us from all the terrible effects for where our birth and Adam fell. The curse of Adam has been removed because we are in Christ. Yes, Adam was a curse because he didn't listen. He disobeyed God. A penalty, the penalty for sin that was ours because we was, had the, we was part of the first creation was lifted and paid for and we now are part of new creation. The power of sin that enslaved us, condemned us and separated us from God has been broken because we have received new life. The new life of Christ, which we are given freely for all us to have faith in. Now we'll go on the next slide. There we are, fella. Colossians 3, 1 to 3. Since then, you have been risen with Christ. Set your hearts on all things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, but not on earthly things. For you died, and your life now is hidden with Christ in God. It is hidden because, I oh know I don't like that picture now, it's because your sins have been forgotten. You hand it all to God. He doesn't keep pointing fingers. Oh, you did that last year. Oh, you did that a year before. No. Your sins that you give to God have been wiped clean and forgotten. That's why it's in hidden in Christ. These verses lay a foundation for the su successful Christian living by pointing out the consequences of being raised the consequences of being raised for Christ because that we seek what is from above and not what is from below our lives are hidden and forgotten the sins are forgotten our old lives are wiped clean because we are raised in Christ we walk in a newness of life It's our new purpose, our new change of life. Our purpose is to carry on what Jesus did. That is our, pur our purpose, is to carry on following and doing what Jesus did. The Great Commission. I won't be Liz and say, come on everybody, remember it. No, <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> In fact, everything that Jesus has done for us, I will keep saying this, as, course, as the best thing, it's brought us back to life. We are alive and it's all down to Jesus. It's not our doing. Because how often have we failed because we've tried to do it in our own way? Mm. We have fallen. But with Christ, we don't fall. He is there to hold us up. He is there to comfort us. He is there to guide us. He is there that we are born again. We are alive in Him. 
Just like it says in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. This is certainly the most well-known verse in the Bible. I think we all know our we can all repeat this off by hand, off by heart, without even looking. I know Andy can, it's one of his favourite verses, that's the only verse he can tell me off by heart, is John 3.16. Mm. Hiya. <laughs> Sleeping down there. No, no <laughs> the, fa the phrase translate to one and only son, or the only begotten son, uses the Greek word monogam. Monogam. This word literally means made of the same stuff. We are made of the same stuff that Jesus is. We are made of the same stuff God is because God has created us. So why the heck do we keep sinning? Why the heck does the world turn upside down the way it is right now? If we are made of the same stuff as Jesus. The world's gone topsy-turvy. It's getting worse. <clears throat> the life offered to those who believe in Christ is eternal. Like he says, it's eternal life. From the Greek word meaning never-ending. The alternative to life in Christ is destruction. To perish. This explains purpose of God sending Jesus for our salvation. John, hopefully, John 6, 47, 51. Yep. I tell you the truth. He who believes in the everlasting life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread is my flesh which I give for the life of the world. There's two examples, because we all know the story of the desert with Moses and God feeding them by sending down the manna from mm -hmm. heaven. Jesus explaining that he is the manna, he is the bread of life. God sent him from heaven. I just love the way the Bible reads it's, it enters my heart right now because it, it makes me see a different way so I can talk to you about it. In the past I would never put connection with Jesus and the bread from man that was in the desert with Moses but through having that relationship with God he's got me to understand it that the manna in the Old Testament was also a prophecy that Jesus is the bread of life from heaven in the New Testament. Everything that is written in the Old Testament is a prophecy to when Jesus came from heaven. It's all about Jesus throughout the whole of the Old Testament as well as the new in manly form. As the people begin to complain about Jesus, claims to have come from heaven, as they did, they, they complain, but hey ho. He gives a deeper, which is in John 6, 38. He gives a deeper explain to it, this meaning. In the wilderness, God sent physical bread from heaven. He met the physical need. That the manna was symbolic, representing Jesus. In particular, the manna had the accept, to be accepted as a gift and simply 
It was simple. It was just a gift. Like Jesus was a gift to us. Now, according to Jesus, God has sent the true bread from heaven, John 6, 32, in the form of a person, John 6, 33. This is Christ himself, John 6, 48. Eternal life is only for those who believe in Christ. So those that follow Jesus, who have a personal relationship and is willing to grow in Christ, is alive and will have eternal life. But those who do not know Christ, and those that pretend to know Christ, who don't live in Christ, who are not alive in Christ, will perish and end in hell on the second death. You know, because that's coming back a lot lately. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Again, he was there from the beginning. He was there from creation. He lived and died so that he, we might not die, that we may day, die to self, I can't put my teeth in, and live for him. And he is seated on the right hand of his majesty, God, continually interceding as the king. The priest of heaven is for us. The, the church he loves for the glory of God the Father. This is glorious statement in fact. It's a profound promise that keeps our souls eternally secure in God and in our salvation. He never changes character. He has got wisdom and it's all free gifts of, grace, of grace to all whom trust in him. He gives stability to our souls, to our spirit, and he gives us rest in our heart. The unchangeable nature of our <coughs> Saviour, Jesus Christ, is all embracing assurance that his word is faithful. His promises are true. His saving grace is free to all who trust in him for salvation. And none of the many precious promises contained in the word of God can ever fall. The unchangeable God has spoken for his unchangeable son, who is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and through eternity. He loves his, un his love is unconditional. His grace is everlasting. His truth endures for one generation to another. He has never changed. His word has never changed. God's word has never changed in the Bible. Nothing has ever changed. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. Ephesians 2, 1-10 As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were, we were by nature objects of wrath. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us live with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that we have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He is all, God has already made our space next to Jesus on the throne next to God. He has already created that space for us. 
all we've got to do is carry on following Jesus and being obedient to God's word. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness of using Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by the works so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul's explaining this in Ephesians 2, 8-9, that we are saved by grace, not by works. But then clarifies this in Ephesians 2, 10, that the works are still important when he says, for we that have been made in us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God preferred, prepared beforehand uh, to be our way of life. We are created to do good works in Jesus Christ. Speaking of issues and of circumstances, he is also discussed in Galatians and makes a point that Jesus, in his flesh, has been made, made, made both groups into one and has broken down and divided the wall. This is the hostility between us. It's the division. It's the hostility. We are angry. Jesus is showing us that we are angry because we're living in a sinful world. Paul is making the same point that he made in Galatians 3.23. There is no longer a Jew or a Greek. And Romans 2 and 9 says, rather a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. So we are God's chosen people. Inside, we are Jews. Not literally, but this is what it's saying. We are the same as his chosen people. Deep in our hearts, we are the Jews that he had chosen. We was chosen a while back from the time of creation. Go and kick him. Excuse me. by rights we should have no part in God's life but because he has put the Jews and the Gentiles together in one sheep pen with one genuine shepherd we are all one body there is no difference to me Julian me Andy me Helen me Sue me Louise hi Lev Christian <laughs> yes <laughs> or even Auntie Doris well, yeah. <laughs> can I, can be... I could pick <coughs> one if he's not here. <laughs> but I'm video in it. <laughs> Jesus Christ has made it so that God's people, true Israelites, is based on faith. We are now Israelites. It's weird looking, but we are God's true people. There is no one separate. We are one human creation. There is no separate. We are all as one. <coughs> so again, I will ask you this question. What 
does it mean to be alive in Christ? First, you see, Jesus is part of creation. He was there when God created the world. He was there at the beginning of your, when you was conceived. He was there when you was knitted in your mother's womb. He knew you from your beginning of life when you was being formed as a little cell. He already knew you. He knew you when you was being conceived. That's very freaky. <laughs> and that's very disturbing, but if you think of it. But he already knew you as that little cell that was divided into two cells to four cells until you became a baby in your mother's room. Every part of the movement to make you who you are, Jesus was there knowing you and wanting a relationship with you there at that point. Again, Jesus, there is no falseness about him. He is perfect. He is sinless. He is, always has been sinless and always will be. He was the same yesterday, today and forever. He is the truth. There is no blemish or spot on him. He will never change. Secondly, Satan will do everything to make sure that we will turn away from God. He will be that little parrot on your shoulder saying you don't need